Hello everyone. I am Spiros. I work as a tech cloud team. I need to also set my timer. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> so I work at the cloud team, and I will talk to you about Fedora in CentOS Dojo. Uh, it's a sister project of uh, CentOS. Some people would watch it as an upstream CentOS. Um, that's a bit close to true for some packages and some pieces of software. And I will start from Magnum to get why I'm going to talk about Fedora. And also I'm the PTL of the project, so I have to talk about this. Um, so Magnum is an OpenStack API service, which is part of the OpenStack ecosystem. It's a small and simple service that has an API, a database, and a conductor that uh, receives RPCs from the API. It uses the same credentials as uh, the OpenStack, all OpenStack projects are using with uh, the Keystone service. And it allows users to choose different cluster types. Uh, these clusters are single tenant. It means that they are isolated um, with uh, virtual machines or physical hardware, and uh, depending on what the user chooses. And then the user is free to deploy a multi-tenant environment inside that cluster, which is a bunch of uh, machines. And the big advantage that uh, we're using it, as I'm going to say later, is that um, users can create clusters with one click and they can have advanced features such as multi-master, load balancers, etc. So what are the cluster types? The cluster types are container orchestration engines, which stands for COE, which is an acronym that we are stuck with. Um, and we offer the first or the most popular. It's uh, Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. Mesos is more popular for other use cases, but uh, we we'll try to support it, but we have a much smaller user base. And this US is another framework that sits on top of Mesos. Um, so what is a Magnum cluster? As I mentioned, a Magnum cluster is, a, is an entry in the Magnum database that links and points to different resources provided by OpenStack, such as compute instances that can be virtual or physical, neutral networks, which is the networking component of OpenStack, security groups, again, offering, offered by the networking component, block storage volumes, um, shared file systems, load balancers, etc. All of these are managed by the existing OpenStack service that uh, were created before Magnum. Uh, so Magnum uses all of these services and focuses on lifecycle operations and the configuration of the clusters. Uh, it does scale up and down. We try to do upgrades and healing and replacing uh, bad nodes, which will eventually go bad. And each cluster is self-contained, uh, but is also integrated with external system. For example, for monitoring, there is a monitoring uh, component inside the cluster, but it can also be hooked to a central monitoring if an organization has, has one uh, to integrate with. Um, the big advantage of uh, Magnum and other similar services that exist in the public cloud is that it's using the native clients. So if people are used to using Docker on their laptops, they can just use Docker again using Swarm. And if they are using GoopCTL in a public cloud or at home or in their university, you can use uh, GoopCTL with Magnum again, which is exactly the same interface. And to have the, all this uh, deployment secured, uh, Magnum is orchestrating certificates that are stored either in, in its database or in the key store service of OpenStack, which is Barbican. This is the architecture that I'll skip very quickly, but uh, um, on, on the <coughs> bottom right, uh, where we can see orchestration, compute, network, bare metal, and block storage are the, the pre-existing OpenStack services that Magnus sits on top. And on the left, it's the um, layout, a very simple layout of the cluster that has a simple operating system like Fedora, Atomic, CoreOS, or others and it has the orchestrator and the components that you need to run containers. And uh, once all the orchestration deployment is done, you can use the native REST APIs, as I mentioned. Uh, so why would you choose to use uh, Magnum? Um, because it's centrally managed and it's self-service, so users can just consume the APIs and they create, create what they want they can choose the size of the clusters, they can share the clusters between them. And it's useful if you have more than five or 10 clusters that you can count by, by heart and 
I actually name them. At CERN, we have like 400 clusters that I will show you later, so it's very handy for us to manage them centrally. Also, the accounting comes from free. So since we are based on the existing OpenStack services, um, all the accounting for cores, RAM, networks is uh, done um, uh, a priori because we are consuming existing OpenStack services. And also, it's a very easy entry point for new users. So if a, some, if a user doesn't, hasn't heard again any, um, before about containers, he can just deploy a cluster and start consuming the API with uh, two simple commands. And since we are in a CentOS event, one very important thing is that the operating system has become a commodity in this use case, and you can choose exactly which operating system your users want to run because they cannot uh, interact with it uh, directly. Um, so this is um, mostly oriented for people that are running uh, OpenStack clouds, not consuming them. Um, but uh, some key points that we had, uh, had to go through were how to design the network. Uh, so we wanted to offer users like an isolated environment, and we wanted to have tenant networks, so each user should have its own network. At CERN, the situation is very a little bit different. If you are users at CERN, which we have the flat provider network and with uh, public APIs. And also, um, users' uh, uh, deployments should use a private uh, container registry and not just pull things from Docker Hub. So for example, at CERN, we have uh, the Linux support base image, which is based on CERN CentOS, and it's recommending base image for users to use here. Um, also, um, since we are providing a cluster, we are providing the operating system with the components that to run containers. So it's, in a way, we provide also software. So some uh, rules about CI and testing uh, apply when testing Magnum. Like, we need to have a CI to test all the combinations of versions that we're going to offer to users that we're not actually going to control after they are st start using it. And now I'm getting to Fedora Atomic. Uh, Fedora Atomic is a variation of Fedora that is uh, created by the Atomic Working Group. Uh, we, and it's oriented mostly to run containers um, with a Docker and Kubernetes stack. So what is Atomic? Atomic has an immutable file system. Uh, it, that means you cannot touch it. And the first time that you might log in in a host that runs Fedora Atomic, you may end up in this situation, which is a little terrifying in the beginning. So as you can see here, I'm a root. There is not DNF or YAM to install anything. I cannot create files in slash. I cannot touch user bin. Basically, if I don't run something in a container or in my home directory, I cannot do anything. And of course, if you can do a few things in your home directory, there are no such things like pip or GCC, so you cannot compile and add software. Everything must run in, in containers. Um, the size of the operating system is a bit small, like almost minimal. It's 400 megabytes. And the total operating system is composed by RPMs with an, uh, structure and, uh, an internal data structure that's called RPM OS3, which is like, a, like Git uh, for RPMs. Actually, Git for file systems. And RPM OS3 is Git for RPMs. Uh, so why we are using Fedora Atomic? Um, one of the reasons is that um, the container-related projects are higher velocity than traditional applications. So uh, this is why we started with that. And it has usually the latest kernels with the latest features. And we are trying to use the upstream Fedora, project, Fedora Atomic builds. So we don't have to maintain a CI. We don't have to test like if the kernel has a bug. Okay, we will have to test it, but it's verified by a larger community than us that uh, the operating system is in, in a good state and can, it can be consumed. Um, also, uh, the terrifying part that I mentioned in the beginning, which is the immutable file system that, and you, that you cannot customize it, it forces us to move everything to containers. So whatever we want to run, it must be a self-contained package and can be deployed as a Docker or another type of container. This is also a link how we can download it. So if you work a lot with a, with a project and an operating system, eventually you become a contributor. So after working a lot with Fedora, Atomic, uh, and uh, of course with CentOS, 
personally I ended up co-maintaining the Kubernetes package for Fedora and CentOS as well. And if you're into packaging, we are using also the same disk git for both uh, CentOS and Fedora, uh, which it was in the latest uh, Fedora conference, it was a big thing to discuss. Um, also, we are early testers for uh, like new features like Scopio, which is like a tool to manage containers, and the atomic utilities that exist only at, in atomic host, both in CentOS and Fedora. And we ended up contributing and depending a lot on a type of containers that I will mention right after, which is the system containers. So one of the ways to extend with simple applications the host is using a Docker container or um, CRIO or something else if you're deep into the container world. But what about systems that are much closer to the host that you cannot easily containerize? Uh, so for this, uh, the Atomic Working Group created the Atomic Utility, which runs containers with system D and run C, which is the smallest unit that all the container projects depend on to spawn to just talk to the kernel and start the process based on the configuration about uh, mounts and control groups uh, that are defined in a file. Um, so in this example, um, I'm running, uh, in the first example, the kubelet, which is the most base component of Kubernetes. And the right below, I'm uh, trying to run Docker, which is the Docker daemon, which again is using run C, and it's just an API daemon that you can talk to with a client, which is a Docker client. And on the bottom half, you can see um, how what the Magnum node looks like after we invested a lot in container uh, in system containers. So you can just list them and you see all the components that are running them and they are backed by the type, file type I, I mentioned before, uh, which is OS3. So these are the, uh, their containers very close to the operating system and they are not and they are managed only by systemd as a normal service. So all these stuff are used for the certain container service here. So Magnum is the upstream project that I'm contributing to and more members of, of the cloud team are contributing to. And this is composed as a certain container service. Uh, these are some numbers for the cloud service. Uh, it's a very big private cloud. We have 300,000 cores and 450 clusters uh, running uh, Kubernetes, Docker, and Mesos. Most of them are Kubernetes. And we have, um, at the time that I took uh, this slide, it was 1,500 VMs. After some benchmarks finished, this number is a bit lower now because we deleted these resources. And at the, at the bottom, you can see all the available uh, resources that we offer in the cloud. Um, so this is the Magnum uh, deployment timeline. This is a relatively old uh, slide, but uh, since that, uh, it's a production service, and we are continuing iterating and uh, improving. Um, what needed to be done at CERN was integrating with uh, uh, CERN specific systems like CVMFS, uh, which is used only in the hub world, and some networking integration because I mentioned we have a, a, a bit different network than um, uh, the standard uh, OpenStack clouds. And the, the main focus was to hide all this complexity and offer a user, the user, to the users a simple uh, API to consume. And then, as I said, since 2016, we are running it as a production service. So what the interaction with Magnum looks like, uh, it, this is the true for, for at CERN and also in any other cloud that uh, has uh, Magnum deployed. So there are some templates that describe the cluster and has the parameters of the cluster. And here are some, some public ones that we advertise to users. And then with uh, two simple commands, users can start consuming uh, the container orchestration engines. So the first command is just to create a cluster. It takes as a parameter the template, a name, a keeper that I'm not listing here, but it's mandatory as well, and the number of nodes that you want. And then you wait a few minutes, five or 10, depending on the size of the cluster. And then we can do with one more command to retrieve the TLS certificates and then you can have admin access to the cluster and start deploying applications and building your service. What are the use cases uh, for CERN? Most of them were mentioned by in the previous presentation, but uh, 
Um, there are, most of them are very good matches for containers. The biggest one is batch processing. Batch processing consumes uh, 75 or 80 percent of the data center, so it's like by far the biggest one. But um, other use cases like end user analysis, which is very popular with Jupyter notebooks, machine learning. Uh, there are a lot of tools that depend now, not depend, that, but they can easily deploy it on Kubernetes and they can compose very uh, complex applications. Infrastructure management, this is mostly for IT, not for physicists, like moving uh, data around and uh, web servers and uh, other platforms. Continuous integration, so a lot of CIs are running inside containers. And of course, uh, we're doing a, a very big sandwich with OpenStack and we run OpenStack on OpenStack and then clusters and then again OpenStack on